Hello everyone, this is Latia for you coming today with another scripture from the Lord. We will be in Psalms 45 verses 6 through 10 as well as Isaiah 54 verses 7 through 11. Let's go ahead and pray and we can get started. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for your help. Thank you for your strength. We love you. We give you all the glory, honor, and praise. Lord God, bless the listeners who are here today. God, just touch their hearts and give them hope and joy. Give them a special anointing for the time left ahead, God. We love you. We give you all the glory for every good thing that is in our life comes from you. We love you, Jesus. Bless this word in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, you guys. So we are in Isaiah, I mean, Psalms 45 first, and that we're going to start with verse six. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of uprightness. So here it is talking about the throne. This is a, a psalm of the sons of Korah. Um, and so um, it's, it's here talking about, it's a song. It's talking about the kingdom of God, right? And, and his reign and his rule and the reach and the power of his rule, which will go on forever and ever. It says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of uprightness. So this scepter is a representation of the type of kingdom that is being run. And it's saying here that God's up God's kingdom and his scepter is a scepter that represents uprightness, right? Goodness, truth, the things that are just and good, right? We are we are so glad to serve a king who is a good king, not an evil king. We we serve a God who loves us, who cares about how we are dressed, how we're clothed, how we're taken care of, who cares about the small details. It's the scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of uprightness. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. So God loves righteousness. He hates wickedness. Let's read the rest of it. Therefore, God, your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. That's so beautiful. It says you have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. So when you love righteousness and you hate wickedness, that means you're like your father. You're just just like your daddy, you you love the things that are good, the things that are upright, the things that are pure and lovely, and you hate those things which come from the evil one. You hate the things of darkness, right? It says you have loved righteousness and hated wickedness, right? You don't you don't align yourself with things that are not of God. Um, it says, therefore, God, your God has anointed you. So he is God. He is your God, right? And you've shown that through the fact that you love righteousness and you hate wickedness. And what is he going to do as a result of your loving righteousness and hating wickedness? He's going to anoint you. He's going to cause his anointing to come over you. This is a special anointing, right? It says, with the oil of gladness be on your companions. He's going to cause us to be glad more than our brethren, right? He's going to cause us to, to shine and radiate that goodness, that gladness, that joy beyond our, our, our brothers and sisters, our companions, right? It says the oil of gladness. Wow. And, and why are you receiving these things? Because you have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Um, God loves a, a person who is zealous, right? Who hates evil. I can't remember exactly the name of the person in the Old Testament, the one who um, there were the, the priest or the, 
the men of God, the men who were supposed to be the men of God, were bringing the prostitutes into the temple. And the one man like killed the guy um, who did that in the, in the temple. And he was seen as a zealous man for God. And God was pleased with that because he, he wanted, he wanted people who were after him, who weren't, who weren't going to allow his temple to be defiled, who weren't going to just allow any old thing in the house of God. It says, therefore, God, your God has anointed you. Why? Because you have loved righteousness and you've hated wickedness. It says, therefore, God, your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companion. So he's not just going to give you the oil of gladness like he gives it to everyone else, right? He's going to do it beyond your companions. You who sit and listen to teachings uh, of the word of God, who love his word, who, who let it pour over them, who search through it like treasure, you will have a special blessing. What is that blessing? You're going to have the oil of gladness, just like everybody else, but it's going to be beyond your companions. He's going to pour it and lavish it on you. He's going to cause you to be glad and to walk in a special anointing of gladness. It says you have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. And it's evident. It's evident in you because you're sitting listening to this, right? You, How many people actually do Bible study? How many people actually sit and listen and talk to God about his word, chew on his word, enjoy talking and listening? listening um, to his word. It's a sign that you love righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. Verse eight, your robes are all fragrant with myrrh and aloe and cassia from ivory palaces, string instruments make you glad. I can remember when we first did this um, this teaching, we, we've done this verse before from um, Psalms 45, and I just was so in love with the thought of ivory palaces and stringed instruments, right? It says, your robes are all fragrant with myrrh and aloe and cassia. Um, those those are, I want to say those are wedding um, anointings that, that are prepared for a bride, right? It says uh, your robes are all fragrant. So that means that God is going to give, not only it's going to clothe you and bless you with beautiful robes, but he's going to cause all all of them to smell a certain way, right? And remember, we were talking about having the fragrance of God on you, right? He says, all fragrant with myrrh and aloes and cassia from ivory palaces, string instruments make you glad. He's going to cause all this lavishness of beauty, right? If you don't think you serve a lavish God, oh, read the word. He is lavish. He pours it on thick, right? And and it's so apparent because not only did he tell me Psalms 45, he told me Isaiah 54, and those are both very lavishly pouring on scriptures, how he anoints and blesses his beautiful children and how he loves on them with beautiful things and giving them the best of the best, right? It says your robes are all fragrant, Imagine when we get to heaven ha being dressed with these beautiful thick garments um, and not only are they beautiful and thick and they're always clean. You don't have to worry about doing laundry in heaven, right? All of your stuff smells of this smell that is of God. It's a godly smell. And, and it's not like, you know, with your own clothes. You know how sometimes with your own clothes, you don't smell them, right? Because it's your stuff, right? And you smell it all the time. No, we're going to be able to smell fragrant myrrh, aloes, and cassia on our clothes. 
right? We'll be able to, to distinguish the scent of God on us, right? It says from ivory palaces, string instruments make you glad. Wow. He's going to cause string instruments to be played all around you and make you happy, right? You already have the oil of gladness beyond your companions. You already have these beautiful robes that you're lounging in and just living the good life. But also, you're going to be in ivory palaces, right? We, we've seen um, the Taj Mahal, right? But we're talking about real ivory everywhere. Ivory palaces. Imagine being in this smooth, white, beautiful ivory palace and hearing heart music and smelling the fragrance of God and being able to sit and just enjoy your father in lavish beauty, right? This is going to be a beautiful sight. It, his scepter is a scepter of uprightness. It, it's There's nothing that's there that's going to be unpleasant. And God is going to take you to special places when you serve him and serve his kingdom and when you have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Amen. All right, let's keep going. Verse 9. Daughters of kings are amongst your ladies of honor. At your right hand stands the queen in gold of Ofer. So God is causing um, us and, and others to be in places of honor, right? It says daughters of kings are amongst your ladies of honor. So God is going to surround himself with these beautiful women of honor. At your right hand stands the queen in gold and over. So she's dressed in this beautiful gown, probably most likely. Um, it's made up of gold and over. And it says, amongst your ladies of honor, she's going to stand at your right hand, right? So here where it says, at your right hand stands the queen in gold and offer, it's basically referring to a designated position. This is like a special position that will be held. And the Lord was kind of just showing me that this is like for the bride, right? This queen is like the bride and she's at his right hand. That's where a bride would stand at the right hand of the groom. Room. And this gold of Ophir is coming from a special place. This is no um, regular gold, right? They don't know where Ophir exactly was, but they know that when you got gold from there, that was like a very special gold and it was very desired. It's mentioned in the book of Job. It's mentioned in um, Song of Solomon, as well as... Um, with David, right? So this is a special gold and this is a special position of honor that is, it's being designated here for the bride. So and this bride that I'm referring to is the church. And it says daughters of kings. So not only are people going to be given places of honor, but their children will also have places of honor besides God, right? It says, hear, O daughter, and consider and incline your ear. Forget your people and your father's house. So God is calling you out right now. He's telling you to make a choice, right? He's telling you to make a decision. And what is that decision? To incline your ear, turn your ear towards him. Listen to him. Why? Because he has good things in store for you. It says, hear, O daughter. So he wants you to pay attention to his words. And see, he's already calling you his daughter. He's already calling you out, right? And it says, oh, daughter, and consider and incline your ear. Forget your people and your father's house, 
right? He wants you to turn away from what you know and turn towards him. He has better things in store for you, more and more close than his own children, right? He's going to have an inheritance that's greater than his own children. That's what the word says. It's going to be better than that. He has things in store for you. It says, hear, O daughter, and consider and incline your ear. Forget your people and your father's house. He wants you to turn towards him. He wants you to be his bride. He wants you to be at his right hand. He wants to lavish you with beautiful garments and cause you to smell like him and be like him and sit and listen to the music that he likes to listen to, right? It's going to be a wonderful life living with the king. All right, let's keep going. So we're in Isaiah 54. Remember, Isaiah 54, it's my favorite chapter in the Bible. I have gone to this chapter many times in my life. So um, let's just go ahead and get started. It says in verse 7, For a brief moment I deserted you, but with great compassion I will gather you you have you ever been scattered have you ever been all over the place and 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 felt like god is not with you he says for a brief moment i deserted you you we probably deserved it oh we always deserved it when it was happening to us right we put ourselves in positions that we should not have we sort forsake the words of god we walked away from him it says for a brief moment i deserted you but with great compassion i will gather you he's gonna gather you back up right? He's going to gather you back and get get you together. Have you ever been when you were a little child or done this for a child where they drop something and they spill it all over the floor or they, they drop all their little toys or something on the floor and you rush over to them and you pick them up and you pick all that stuff up off the floor and you, you take them somewhere and sit with them and play with them or you've been like that as a child. That's what God is going going to do to us. He's going to gather us together. He's going to pull us into himself. It says, for a brief moment, moment I deserted you, but with great compassion, meaning he's going to care for us. He's going to see our situation and he's going to care about the things that we're going through. It says, but with great compassion, that's like that empathy, that love, that emotion. He's going to feel what you feel and he's going to gather you. He's going to pull you together. Verse eight, an overflowing anger for a moment. I hid my face from you, but with with everlasting love, I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. We deserve a lot of what we get. We deserve all of what we get when it, it comes to, you know, our sins and our trespasses against God. And and he's angry, you know, and here it shows that he he's indignant. He does not want um, for us to be walking in that way, right? He doesn't want us to walk in evil. We never know when the enemy might be prowling about and actually catch you up while you're out there. So he, he wants us to be upright with him all the time. He protects us sometimes even in our mess, right? So that we aren't over over taken right it says in overflowing anger for a moment right his anger only lasts a moment it says in overflowing anger for a moment i hid my face from you right so he has deserted us for a moment he has hidden his face from us for a moment he was angry with us for a moment but god always turns back to his children right when you repent when you turn away from that sin he has no choice but to turn towards his children. He is drawn towards us. He loves us. He has a choice. He, he doesn't have to 
do that right but he chooses to turn towards us he chooses to gather us with compassion towards him it says I hid my face from you but with everlasting love I will have compassion on you have you ever sought God's face and felt like you could not find him anywhere yes it says it's only for a moment though right it says I hid my face from you but with everlasting love I will have compassion on you he's gonna have compassion on you don't believe the words of the enemy God cares for you he sees you he sees your circumstances he sees your life situations he sees the bills you have to pay he sees your children he sees your job he sees your parents he sees everything that you're going through but with everlasting love I will have compassion on you says the Lord your redeemer it's going to have compassion. It's going to cause your the oil of gladness to be greater than even your companions. You're going to feel and experience a, a new level of gladness and joy in the Lord. All right, let's keep going. Verse 9, this is like the days of Noah to me. As I swore that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth, so I have sworn that I will not be angry with you and will not rebuke you. So God is acknowledging the times that we live in. He sees the evil of this world. He says, this is like the days of Noah to me. He is looking down and he is seeing no love in the people. He is seeing evil. He is seeing um, a place where he wants to just wipe it out right but it says as I swore that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth it doesn't say but let me reread that this is like the days of Noah to me as I swore that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth so have I sworn that I will not be angry with you and will not rebuke you. God has said he is not going to be angry with you any longer, right? He said, so I have sworn that I will not be angry with you. I will not rebuke you. He's not going to send you away, right? You have a dependable father who is there for you in good times and in bad and thick and in thin, right? You should, it says, as I swore that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth. He could just swipe this all away. He could cause all the waters of the earth to just take it all out, but he chooses not to. It says, so I have sworn that I will not be angry with you and will not rebuke you. Your God is not going to be angry with you. He's not going to rebuke you and send you away and cause you to just, you know, go with the rest of the world. No, he cares. He sees and he's not going to rebuke us. It says, this is like the days of Noah to me as I swore that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth. So I have sworn that I will not be angry with you and will not rebuke you. Verse 10, for the mountains may depart and the hills be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you and my covenant of peace shall not be removed, says the Lord who has compassion on you. For the mountains may depart and the hills be removed. It does not matter, you know, if if the person is even in tribulation God still has steadfast love, right? He still loves you. He still cares. He still cares even for the person who's in tribulation. He still sees them. He didn't want them to have to stay there, right? It says, for the mountains may depart and the hills be removed. The, everything on earth might be wiped away, but God's steadfast love is not going to leave your side. It will never leave you. It says, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you. God is going to always be there for you. He is a dependable father. Once you get a hold of that, you realize no one can defeat you. Who is man, right? Because God is with you. You, you won't fail. It says, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you. And my covenant of peace shall not be 
removed. Wow. My covenant of peace shall not be removed. He's not going to take his peace away from you. It's a promise. It's a covenant that he has with you. How does he have a covenant of peace with you? Through the Prince of Peace, through Christ Jesus, his son. It says, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you. And my covenant of peace shall not be removed. No one's going to be able to remove that covenant of peace. No one's going to be able to remove his son away from your side. It says, says the Lord who has compassion on you. He, his compassion is on you. He sees your situation. He sees your finances, right? There is no area or part of you that he doesn't see. He sees the longing of your heart. Even if you're lonely, he sees that. And he has, he's going to have compassion on you about it. Amen. All right. So let's read it all together again. It says, for the mountains may depart and the hills be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you. My covenant of peace shall not be removed, says the Lord who has compassion on you. Verse 11. O oh, afflicted one, storm tossed and not comforted. Behold, I will set your stones in antimony and lay your foundations in sapphire. Wow. Oh, afflicted one. Remember, we can be afflicted. We have the afflictions and the trials of man that we face on a day-to-day -day basis. But it says, oh, afflicted one, storm-tossed and not comforted. Have you been storm-tossed and, and there was no comfort for you? That's okay. God is turning his face towards you, right? It says storm-tossed and not comforted. Behold, he's telling you, Behold, look, I will set your stones in antimony. That means that he's setting beautiful foundations in this very silvery, um, silvery metal, right? It, you know, the stuff that's in between bricks, the mortar that's in between the bricks. He's not just putting regular mortar in between your bricks, right? He's putting antimony. It looks like silver. And he's, he's putting it in between your bricks. It says, I will set your stones in antimony. So he's not going to put bricks there, right? He's going to put precious stones. He's going to build your house of precious stones. If it weren't so, he wouldn't say it, right? It says, I will set your stones in antimony and lay your foundations with sapphire. That means you're going to have beautiful blue um, jewels all around the base um, of your home right? It, it's going to be a spiritual thing and it's going to be something you receive as well in heaven. It says, and lay your foundations with sapphire. And sapphire, you know, jewels, precious stones are hard. They're not easily broken, right? So he's going to lay a foundation in something that is strong and that's sturdy and that's found in him. Amen. All right. So let's read it all together again. This is all oh, afflicted one, storm tossed and not comfortable. Behold, I will set your stones in antimony and lay your foundations with sapphires. He has beautiful plans in store for you. Just trust in him. Put all your trust, all your hope, all your love on him. Lavish it on him. Remember him as your first love. Not just in service and doing, but remember who was the one who saved you, who loved on you and had compassion on you and gave you that oil of gladness beyond your companions. Remember him because he remembers you and he's not going to leave you. Amen. All right, let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for truth. Thank you for love. We love you, God. There is no God but you. We give you all the glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, you guys. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you and give you, his children, his peace. Take care.